A few years ago, I was talking to someone who's uh, not a Christian, who, who doesn't go to church, but we were talking a little bit and the, the topic of church came up and she said, if I ever went into church, there'd be a lightning bolt. You know, that, that she thought that she wasn't good enough. She, she'd done so many bad things in her life that she just wasn't good enough uh, to go into church. And I think that a lot of people have got this kind of idea that they're not good enough for God, that they've done too many bad things and that they, they can't go into church. And I wonder how have people got this idea? I wonder if people have got this idea because this is actually a message which one way or the other churches are sending out. And I think that's a big problem because that's not the gospel message as we will see. And that's what this passage is about today, about the, the, the calling of Matthew, is about the kind of people that Jesus wants. Um, so this is, uh, as I said, the calling of Matthew, and the, the eagle-eyed among you will have immediately spotted that we are reading Matthew's Gospel, and this is the calling of Matthew. And it does seem to be that this is Matthew's description of his own sort of calling from Jesus. Uh, if you look in other Gospels, uh, this is also described in Mark and Luke, but there they use the name Levi. And it was quite common in those days for people to have more than, uh, more than one name, you know, maybe a Hebrew name and a Greek name or, or, or something like that. Uh, so that seems to be the case, that Matthew is describing his own sort of moment of, of Jesus calling him to follow. And it says, um, Jesus uh, saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Uh, follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Now, a tax collectors in those days, this was probably um, Matthew uh, was sitting at a like a customs point um, or a toll booth, that sort of thing. So perhaps there was a part of road which they needed to pay a toll to cross. Or maybe there was a, um, you know, there were goods traveling in and out of the area. It was on the border of the region and goods traveling in and out of the area, they pay customs on. So that was probably the kind of tax that uh, that Matthew was collecting. Now, tax collectors in those days, um, they were almost uniformly hated. Now, they, they came to be seen as sort of like the, the epitome of a sinner, of a bad person. Now, that's because they were seen as traitors, that they were they were Jewish, but they were working for the authorities, you know, even for the for the Romans. And they, uh, you know, they, they often uh, were, were corrupt as well, that they, you know, so if, if the amount of tax was, I don't know, a certain amount, they would add a little bit to it. And then they would cream, cream that off for themselves and give the, the actual amount to the authorities. So they were kind of self-serving. They were corrupt. They were traitors. Um, they were seen as the, the epitome of a bad person. That was, uh, but by the, the Jews of the day, that was the thing, that they were almost this sort of cartoon villain. That was tax collectors. I wondered if, you know, what we could see, if, if there was, you know, uh, an example today. I mean, obviously, you've got the cartoon villains, like, you know, you've got Bond villains and so on. But I wonder if, if the closest analogy we have today might be something like politicians. You know, that you hear people talking about politicians sometimes saying, well, they're all in it for themselves. They're all corrupt. They don't tell the truth and, and all of that. And, you know, you, you think, well, well, th there's some justification for that, given the way that a lot of polit politicians act um, today. There's an old joke about 99% uh, of lawyers give the rest a bad name. And I think you could maybe say something about um, politicians. But, but that's the thing, isn't it? You know, that tax collectors, rightly or wrongly, fairly or unfairly, had that reputation. They were seen as the lowest of the low, you know, that they were seen as terrible sinners. And that, you know, the, the Jewish people of the day, they didn't like them at all. Um, so and that's why it's so surprising that Jesus says to Matthew, to this tax collector, follow me. You think, well, Jesus, is it, does he not realise what this, this man is? What, what's Jesus doing? And we'll come, on, come back to that in a moment, but uh, Matthew, 
and just gets up and follows him. You know, Matthew just leaves it all and follows Jesus. That Matthew responds to Jesus' call. And for him, it would have been a big deal to go and follow Jesus. For him, it would have been a perhaps even more than for the fishermen, for Jesus' disciples who were the fishermen, that the fishermen, if they stopped following Jesus for, for whatever reason, they could go back to their nets, they could go back to fishing. But Matthew couldn't go back to being a tax collector because when he left that job, they would probably have found someone else pretty quickly who would be prepared to take it on. You know, a lucrative job, well paid, that there would have been... Um, you know, a queue of people, I'm sure, ready to take on that job. So Matthew would not just have been able to to uh, go back to his old life if things didn't work out with Jesus. He follows him anyway. And it says he, he got up and followed him. You know, he wasn't following Jesus in sort of a, a spiritual sense or whatever, but he did literally follow him. It reminds me of a joke. Uh, there was a, a picture I once saw that Jesus is sitting down on a on a bench with someone, and he says, "No, I don't mean on Twitter. I literally want you to follow me." You know, but that's the thing. You know, following someone these days, you know, we follow people on social media, but actually, following Jesus means you know more than that. Um, sometimes means you know going places and doing things, um, you know, literally, not just in a kind of spiritual sense. Um, so Matthew then, he uh, uh, we, we seems like you know, Matthew's sort of being quite sparse with the details of this story. But it seems that Matthew uh, held a, a sort of dinner in honour of Jesus at his house. And so it says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. So it seems that Matthew threw a, a kind of a banquet at his house in honour of Jesus and he invited all of his friends, all of his disreputable friends to come and meet Jesus, you know, all of his tax collector friends and, and everyone he knew from those circles. Uh, now, who do you think was not happy about this? Uh, obviously, it's the Pharisees, isn't it? Uh, last week, we had the teachers of the law this week it's the Pharisees' turn, although I do wonder if there was some uh, overlap between those two groups. But the Pharisees are not happy about this. And it says, when they, when they saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Again, it's this lack of bravery that we touched on last week, that the, the Pharisees, they don't uh, they don't come and ask Jesus, they ask his disciples. So they're not asking him directly. They're trying to get at him via, via his disciples. You know, why does your teacher ask with ta uh, eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, the Pharisees, they were very concerned with who they ate with. Because to eat with someone in those days, and I think even still today, signifies a bit more than just, you know, sharing a meal. But it actually means that, you know, you have a kind of fellowship with them, that you, you're in agreement with them somehow. That, you know, it, it's like if you met with someone out on the street, that's one thing. But if you invited them into your home and f gave them dinner, that would be a different thing. You would be inviting them. You would be hosting them. Um, so the Pharisees were very uh, keen to, to not host people who were sinners you know, who they thought were beyond the pale, who they thought were, you know, bad people. They believed that they needed to separate out from those people, and that meant not eating with them. Now, I know it's, we're looking back on this, and we know what, uh, you know, if you read the passage, you know what Jesus' judgment is on the Pharisees. But just try and put yourself in their perspective. Think about this. Were they right to be concerned because there is a lot in the Old Testament about uh, separating from from sin and even from from sinners this is what it says just to give one example here uh, Isaiah chapter 52 verse uh, verse 11 and this is also quoted in the New Testament depart depart go out from there touch no unclean thing 
Come out from it and be pure, you who carry the articles of the Lord's house. So to be separate from sinners, to come out from that which is evil and be separate from it. You know, that was a big thing, actually, for the, for the people of Israel in the, the Old Testament. And that's perhaps what the Pharisees were thinking about. You know, we need to separate from sinners. We need to not associate with them. And maybe that's that's what they were thinking, or maybe that's how they they justified it. So perhaps they they had a genuine concern for holiness. But given what Jesus says next, it seems pretty clear that actually what they were really thinking about was themselves and their own sort of reputations. And so this is what Jesus says to them. It is not the healthy who need a doctor but those who are ill. So Jesus, he perhaps overhears them asking his disciples and he comes and speaks to them directly. And he gives the analogy of a doctor. He says, it's not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. You know, you don't go and see a doctor if you're feeling perfectly fine, do you? You know, you don't, you don't go and see a doctor if you're, there's nothing wrong with you. That, you know, going to, going to see a doctor, I mean, uh, it, it can be nice to, you know, sometimes people might want to chat, but, but generally speaking, you know, that, that if, you'll feel, if you feel fine, you don't want to go and see a doctor unless you're kind of a hypochondriac or, or something like that. And Jesus is saying it's the same with him, that in the same way that only sick people need a doctor, he's saying that only sinners need him. Only sinners need Jesus. That's what he is saying. And I think what he's doing here is just subtly pointing the finger back at the Pharisees, saying, why is it that you don't think you need me? It's because you think that you're not sinners. You know, you think that those people are bad sinners, but that you yourself are perfectly fine and good. And that's exactly what he came to to, to say is, is not the case. And Jesus, he carries on and he quotes from the Old Testament. He quotes from the book of Hosea, the, the prophet. He says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So Jesus quotes there from the Old Testament. Now, what does this quote mean? In context, it's talking about um, the, the difference between offering sacrifices, you know, the, 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 the practice of of the religious duties which God asked the, the Israelites to do, and actually the internal, the inner kind of mercy and, and love for God that we should have. So you see that it's very possible to do all the outward things, to look very spiritual, to look very religious, but not to actually love God in our hearts and love other people in our hearts and, and have mercy in our hearts. That's the thing with, um, with the Pharisees. They looked very religious, but they didn't have the inner love for God in their hearts. And this quote from Hosea, it's very like that this happened several times actually in the Old Testament. But another example is from the prophet Joel, uh, Joel 2 verse 13, where Joel says, rend your hearts and not your garments. Now he's saying, don't do all of the, the outward signs. Don't make a big song and dance about being sorry before God, but actually just be sorry in your heart, you know, repent in your heart. That's what God really wants. That's what he really cares about. He doesn't want you to rip all your clothes and, you know, make a big song and dance about looking sorry, but actually be, be really sorry and, and repentant in your heart. That's what God really wants. You know, he wants our hearts, not the outward sign, if you like. That's the thing, and that's something which the Pharisees didn't understand. That they thought that being religious was all about the things that they did, about looking religious before other people. But their hearts were a long way from, from God. And it's, you know, sad, but it is true. It's happened all the way through history that sometimes the most religious people can actually be the most self-righteous and the most godless people. They can be the worst, actually. 
This is what Jesus says in um, a similar passage, actually, in Luke chapter 15, verse 7. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. So Jesus says that there's there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 who don't need to repent. Now, do you think there is anyone who doesn't need to repent? Of course not, that we all need to repent. We all sin. We are all sinners. But what Jesus is saying is not that there are actually people who don't need to repent, but that there are people who think they don't need to repent. There are people who think they are righteous, like the Pharisees. And that's exactly the point that Jesus is making here. Jesus has come to call people who know they're sinners, who know they're not good enough for God, not to call people who think that they are so good that they're basically doing God a favour by going to church and all, all of those things, you know, who, who, who have such a high opinion of themselves and their own righteousness. And Jesus says those are not the kind of people that God wants because they're not the kind of people who think they need God. And that's the uh, why Jesus finishes out this, this uh, passage here. This quote which summarises it all. He says, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. That's what Jesus says. And, and again, I think he's, with the crosshairs, aimed at the Pharisees. I'm not come to call the righteous, because there is no one righteous. Jesus has come to call sinners. He's not come to call people who think they are righteous, because they're just lying to themselves. But he's come to call people who are honest about you know, the, the truth about themselves, who are honest about their sin, honest about their need of God, and come to him on those terms. Those are the kind of people that Jesus has has come for. And the problem with the Pharisees is that they'd forgotten what it was all about. They'd forgotten what it was all about. They thought that they were good enough for God because they tried really hard. They thought that they were basically, like I said, doing God a favour even by showing up in the the synagogue or, or whatever. But they they didn't even understand their own sinfulness. They didn't understand their own need of God and their need of Jesus. And they, and that made them very hard on other people. That made them think, well, other people, they're terrible sinners. And you know, isn't it good that we are righteous, good people, and those are, you know, those bad sinners over there, we don't associate with them you know we'll just leave them over there we've got nothing to do with them because they're terrible sinners but we are good people and that was their view and they got it completely the wrong way round so what can we say about this passage what can we conclude about this passage that we can take into into our lives and into the church today well i think there is a warning for us here which is that churches can become very much like the Pharisees. The attitude that the Pharisees have here is very much like the attitude that churches can display today. Again, not all churches, but it it can easily happen. Churches can fall into this this trap, this kind of moralistic and judgmental and holier-than-thou attitude where the, the, the church seems to think, well, we are good people, and it's everyone else who's just a terrible sinner. I was thinking about Mary Whitehouse. Um, younger people may not know who she was, but she was a campaigner for sort of um, moral purity on TV and in, in the media in the, the latter part of the, um, the 20th century. I think sort of the 70s and 80s that she was, um, she was active. And she, as she perceived it, saw the the problem that the moral, the way that sort of um, moral standards had slipped on the BBC and in other other sort of um, on on TV, uh, the sex and violence on TV and, and that sort of thing, and she was uh, campaigning to try and clean things up, saying you know clean up that that filthy language, clean up that that moral sort of decay which is going on. Now. I don't want to make any comment about Mary Whitehouse because I didn't know her and I don't know enough about her motivations. But I just think the public perception of her, 
the way that what she was doing was perceived was very moralistic, judgmental, and holier than thou. And I think that's how the people who remember her do remember it generally, which is that although she may have been right about the moral issues on, on TV and on the radio and so on, I think that the way that uh, it, it was, it was, you know, she went about campaigning. It certainly seemed to leave people with the impression that she was just pointing the finger and saying, "Well, look at all of that filthy language and, and behaviour and so on. It's disgusting. It's terrible, and it needs to be cleaned up." That's the kind of the message which I think people took from it, and that's the message I think that people see the church giving sometimes. You know, well, you people are just filthy, disgusting. You just need to clean up your act. You need to, you need to try harder. You need to pull your socks up and, you know, clean up your act. And I think if that's the message that people get from the church, is it any surprise that they don't want to go to church? I don't think it is. But that's, that's the thing, isn't it? That if that's the message people are hearing, it's not an attractive message. Tim Keller, the pastor from a uh, late pastor from from America, he said once, and I don't have the exact quote to hand. Actually, I couldn't find the exact quote, so I'm having to go from memory here. But he said something like, "Jesus attracted the the down and outs, you know, the the drunks, the the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the you know the the, the people who were forgotten." by the rest of society. Those are the people that Jesus attracted to him. And he said, if the church is not uh, attracting those people today, then maybe we're not preaching the same gospel as Jesus. And I remember reading those words and finding that they, they hit me like a train because the church is supposed to preach Jesus's message, to preach about Jesus. And if those people are not being drawn in to the church, then what are we doing wrong in order for, for um, people not to be drawn to that message? If they think that you know, there will be a lightning bolt if they go into church, well, that's completely wrong. That's not the message that Jesus preached. But why are people not hearing that message today? And I think that's a, a question that the church could do a lot of salt searching about, uh, actually. So how do we guard against this kind of pharisaical attitude? How do we guard against being like the Pharisees of just looking down our nose at other people and thinking that we are, we are already righteous and, you know, and, and all of that? And that's the question that I want to, to finish with just very briefly, which is that I think we need to uh, never move beyond seeing ourselves as sinners even though we may be redeemed sinners, we may be saved sinners, but that until the new creation, until Jesus returns and, and what have you, until it's all finished, we will not, uh, we will always be sinners. Now we may be redeemed, but we are redeemed sinners. And we need to remember that. You know, we need to remember that we never achieve a level of holiness on our own efforts. You know, we never get good enough ourselves to say, oh yeah, we're good and righteous people now. You know, we, we always need to remember our own lack. We always need to remember that we ourselves need to come back in repentance to God for our sins, that we have fallen short of his glory and that we have said and done things we shouldn't do and we've not said and done things which we should have done. You know, we haven't dis displayed the love towards him and towards others that we should. There's always a lack in us. And we need to remember that. Now, rather than thinking that we are perfect, we've made ourselves perfect by our own efforts, we always need to remember that we, we need to come back to God uh, for forgiveness day by day. Tim Keller also once said that mercy is not the job of the Christian, but it's the mark of the Christian. That when we've received mercy ourselves, when we, we really know what mercy is in forgiving God forgiving our sins through Jesus Christ, then we display that same mercy towards other people. And that's the wonderful thing, that when we've received mercy, then we, then we can give mercy because we know what it is. 
I'd just like to, to finish by reading um, from uh, 1 Timothy, uh, chapter 1, verses, uh, verses 15 and 16. This is the Apostle Paul, who I think has a, uh, a really, I think this attitude, he, he grasped this, and this is the same kind of attitude that we should have as well, which will guard against this pharisaical attitude. So let me read this, uh, these couple of verses. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That's the message. And we ourselves need to recognise that we do not deserve God's mercy, but we have been shown mercy in order that God would use that for, for good, for good in the, in the lives of other people. And that's how it should work, rather than looking down our nose at other sinners, that we, we recognise that God's shown his mercy to us as sinners for good in the lives of others. So let's take a moment to pray and ask for God's help that we would not be like the Pharisees, but that we would instead be uh, like Jesus, actually wanting to bring God's mercy to others. So Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus came to uh, not to, for the righteous, but for sinners. And we thank you that that means for, for the likes of us, those who recognise our own sinfulness, and that we cannot save ourselves, but that we need Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that as we receive your mercy, we may be prepared to share that mercy with others, not to, to look down our noses at other people, but actually to look at them with compassion and kindness, wanting them to find the same mercy that we found in you and in Jesus Christ. And we ask for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.